know, sometimes uh, photography is about having fun, and everybody has a different approach to... Sometimes? It's always. Always. Always, always, always about having fun. Photography is always about having fun. There you go. And sometimes people take it sometimes a tad too serious. Yeah, that's uh, no fun. And everybody also has their own way of approaching it. One of the cool things about photography is, that first off, it has to do with art. So it's a matter of, as the artist, if you're happy with what you're doing, then that's right. what really matters. But everybody's a critic and everybody has their own thing and everybody feels their thing is right. Now, when it comes to digital workflow, I know the that workflow I showed you was right. <laughs> but I know the workflow I'm about to show you is right. So two wrongs don't make a that two doesn't apply. <laughs> Bottom line is we now hereby present Drew's workflow. All right, cool. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the great thing about photography is it, it's made up of rules, right? There's, there's always rules of how to use a camera, how to uh, develop film back in the day, but rules are meant to be broken. And what's great about the tools that we provide is, you know, Lau and I and everybody else at Phase One, we, we don't want to uh, decide what the rules are. We want to provide the tools, provide the opportunity, and you as the artist, you as a photographer, get to figure it out. Cool. That can be a little intimidating. Uh, because, uh, you know, the software, the camera, everything's very powerful, but once you wrap your head around it, uh, what it gives you access to is pretty remarkable. So I'll go over my workflow. Um, you work in sessions and in catalogs. Uh, I work exclusively in, uh, in catalogs. Yeah. When, I, uh, okay. when we first started building catalogs, uh, I was working in the support department at Phase One, and uh, somebody needed to be the guinea pig to figure out all the different niche cases uh, with catalogs, so that I volunteered. And uh, my workflow has just kind of evolved from that and, and stuck. So I only use catalogs. Um, I have them all here from 2018 on my little portable drive. I've got plenty of backups, uh, but these are the images that we shot on, on Saturday. So this is the default view of Capture One. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is load my workspace that I use, uh, which I is gonna be very, very different. I guess I wasn't an influence in your workspace, was I? Uh, a little bit, sure, no problem there. But if you notice, you know, not a lot seemed to have changed, but I really simplified my workflow. Oh, I see you take a bunch of icons off that row. Yeah, I took a whole lot of icons, a whole lot of tools, and I kind of number them. I have my library tool that where I can choose the image, and then I have, you know, step number one is my luminance, yep. my exposure. Step number two is going to be my color. Uh, step number three is when I do my lens correction, my crop, my keystoning. Uh, then I'll go into the layers and start adjusting those and bouncing So back rather than them. working in one long menu item like I do, you've actually spread yours across in, yep. in for lack of better words, segments. And then my, my second to last step is of course doing the sharpening and fine tuning, sure. and then I'll output the file. When I output a file, as we can see here, uh, I always output in PSD. So I go from a RAW to a PSD, I'll bring that into Photoshop, do anything else I wanna do, and then I go right back into the exact same catalog in Capture One, it reads the PSDs, and I'll do this at 100%, so from that PSD that I've edited in Capture One, or in Photoshop, I can now output that to a full-size TIFF, a full-size JPEG, a reduced scale for web, whatever I need to do. So I kind of have you know, one master file that's the RAW, one master file that's a PSD, and then I can kind of uh, build all my Interesting way of doing things, yes. Interesting. Well, the correct because uh, you know, I've always just been, you know, put it out to a 16-bit TIFF, and that's my master file. Yep. And if I do anything outward, I, you know, resave that as a version two or a version three, so I'd have the iterations. But, you know, going with the PSD, you keep the the layers and everything, and but you eventually convert over to a TIFF. Yeah, a TIFF and a JPEG, depending on where the file's going, sure. and then I'll have different recipes uh, for whatever it is I need. All right, you can do that. So I'm going to go ahead. Thank you. I have your permission. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to grab one image that uh, we shot yesterday that I want to edit. So this is the native RAW file. Um, it has adjustments on it yep. because we were shooting with the IQ4 and I put a black and white style on there. So this is really the, the native RAW file with that embedded style. So I haven't touched the RAW, I just have some adjustments. In this case it's a contrast curve and the black and white tool is enabled. Okay. Uh, I made a new variant of that, and I reset that variant. So this is actually the uh, the full color uh, raw right. file. Now, this is what I'll go ahead and start editing. I've made some other variants just playing around with it. But if we start from scratch and start editing this image, if I start at number one, I have my exposure evaluation. Uh, this histogram doesn't move. This mm -hmm. is what shows me what I actually captured. So we can see that I was a little underexposed. You know, I was trying to make sure I didn't get any uh, any highlights sure. in that sky as it was moving. 
Uh, so I, I played the safe route. So it's a little underexposed. And again, my base characteristics, it's going to be using a flash ICC profile. I want to change that. I'm going to go to a neutral ICC profile. The curve is auto. It's typically a film standard curve, but I'm going to go ahead and make it a uh, linear response. That's interesting. You, you've, you've brought up linear a couple times. And yeah, I have shied away from that for so long. And I think most people should. You know, do, do as I say, not as I do. I think the, uh, the curve that I choose, linear response, I like to be in complete control of my image and build it up. Okay. And so I want to have the flattest, most boring <laughs> starting point. And then I'll build the color and I'll build the contrast uh, onto that. Well, wow, that's pretty. What helps me with this is if we notice my, my exposure evaluation did move. Yes. Because my exposure evaluation now is basing that exposure evaluation on that linear response curve. Understood. In the camera, it should be film standard, which this is what the camera shows. I was only a little underexposed. But the second I start distributing that information uh, in, a, in a very boring way, now all of a sudden I can see I'm about to stop uh, underexposed. But this gives me that flexibility to push that image. So now that I have my base characteristics out of the way, uh, what I'm typically going to do here, depending on how much I'm underexposed, uh, is I might actually jump over and just bring my exposure up a little bit. You, you wouldn't go to levels and try to adjust the, in the levels? Well, that's kind of the second step. I'm okay. happy with where my, my levels are now, and now I'm just going to hit auto. All right. And so this kind of brings my input values of, uh, of 3 and 231 out to 0 and 255. So Understood. this is kind of my, my working space. I do my, my exposure first, my color second, because okay. color is always a thing that I'm going to keep fine-tuning as I go and, and adjusting. Uh, I'm going to go into my RGB curve. I would typically put on a, a contrast curve from the, the presets, just a standard RGB contrast. This is almost always going to be too much contrast for me, mm -hmm. and when I do an RGB curve, I'm affecting the saturation. I understand. Uh, then I'll go into the Luma, and then I'll start to pull up some of my information. So you're not using any of your exposure contrast sliders or anything along those lines at this point. You went right to the curve, and curve is usually one of the last steps for me. Yeah, and I, I want to start in broad strokes, and then I use those sliders you know, very, very sparingly. So they're okay. kind of my fine-tuning sliders as opposed to you know, the curve. If you move the curve two points on there, it's a huge difference. It is a huge difference. Of so I like to do that in the beginning uh, and then kind of move over into using my, my sliders. So this would be kind of my starting point. The color is uh, horrific, uh, but I have you know, the, the detail and everything that I want. I have bright highlights, which I want. I have dark shadows. I have plenty of contrast you, in between. Do you use a 0 to 255 stage, or are you, you I really just, warning? I use this as reference, okay. because when, when I go through this, I'm going to go into the highlight recovery. I'm going to go into the shadow recovery. Uh, but I need to decide, is this going on uh, my website? Is it going into a print? Because those are going to be two very different uh, right. uh, okay. uh, absolute values for me. Uh, from there, I'm just going to move into the color. What I really like to do is have, we have the color editor and we have color balance. I like to have three of my color balance tools out here. So if I close white balance and I close color editor, I have three of the exact same tools, but I have my, uh, my shadows, my midtones, and my highlights. This is one of the coolest tools first off of, of Capture One. I didn't cover it. I don't use it that often, but knowing it's there and you can do what you're probably about to see Drew do with his really is a pretty slick interface. Uh, yeah, I think so. What I do first is I'm just going to grab a generic white balance. I don't worry too much about getting the white balance perfect because I'm going to play around with the color so much. So in this case, I'm just grabbing something that's more or less neutral. neutral. And that gives me, it's pretty warm, uh, but I'm happy with moving forward from that. I'll minimize my white balance tool. And now my shadows. This is where I start to get a little uh, crazy. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm really going to crank my, uh, my shadow into the, the blue. Really, really cool shadows. I won't touch my midtones. And then my highlights, I'm going to make really, really warm. This makes the image look awful. Yep. But I always start from these really, really broad strokes, and then I kind of refine it down. So this is, you know, your, your typical, like, film guys know this, uh, this a lot, just yep, yep. Uh, cyan uh, and orange. Uh, so I just, that's a, a starting point that I might choose to, to take, and then I'll kind of reduce it from there. So now that I have super, super, <laughs> really, really warm highlights, I'll just kind of refine the color to figure out where I want to stop. Just orange, and now I can reduce that down. And I have this little slider where I can make my highlights darker or lighter. 
And then I'll do the same thing for my shadows. I want them to be really, really cool. And then I can kind of pull it back down. So then I just edge off my shadows, kind of, you know, remove that color until I find a, a place that I'm, I'm happy with. Uh, my midtones, I hardly ever touch the color of my midtones, but I might use a midtone slider. Um, this would be similar to using kind of the levels yeah. midtone, uh, but in this case, <clears throat> I can just kind of shuffle around my midtone contrast so I can get some darker midtones. And I'm really getting some dark midtones. And now I can kind of pop back and forth between my color and my exposure to get everything exactly where I want it. So from there, it's really dark, but I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna kind of lift my midtones and everything towards the end. The color is about where I want it to be. You know, my, my whites are pretty neutral. I still have some color in the sky. This is when I would go into uh, adjusting kind of the rotation and the composition of the image. So in this case, you know, we shot this mill and it's kind of, it, you gotta make a compromise. The, yeah. the, I think that the mill's built crooked uh, but if you kind yeah, you of want those nice vertical lines, right? Going. Over rotate. Yeah. That's good for me. Hit H to get rid of my uh, crop, and then I'm going to go ahead and bring on my keystone tool, and I'm just going to align this one edge with the building there. This tool that uh, Drew's showing you is probably one of the really, really cool tools that you can use specifically if you shoot with wider angle lenses. And because this tool exists, and there's something similar, I believe, in the Adobe products called Upright. But there's, I get annoyed when I see pictures that, you know, Are miss little, this one tool. A little skewed? No, you know, just skewed, but keystoned and everything. It's like with the tools there, there should be no excuse for that. You know. Nicely done. That looks good. Yeah, it's a little bit of a balance for me about, you know, I don't like things too perfect. No, but I would watch the straight edge. I think the center straight edge, I always... Yeah, and I think our eyes sometimes are more inclined to look at a vertical than a mm -hmm. horizontal because horizontal sometimes can recede into the sure. you know, backgrounds and so forth. But. Yeah. So at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and look at my histogram. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the way things have all leveled good. out. I mean, I've got a lot of mid-tone contrast. I've got a lot of highlight information. So I just have that floating tool of my histogram. And, it, you know, just as a side note, I get rid of everything that's going to distract me. There's no labels down here or extra options up here. If I was on my computer, this whole top menu would be hidden. So I could just have as much of the image as possible on a white background. Yeah, I, I do white and I do a lot of Command T and Command B to move everything away so I can evaluate without the, the clutter. Right. So now that I have kind of the base uh, luminance and exposure, the base color, everything that I do on top of this is going to be done on layers. Okay. So if I want to adjust the color, uh, because I have some, such a neutral color of the image to begin with, if I want to bring out the reds or I want to you know, adjust anything, I'm going to do it on a layer. This is, is really helpful for me because I can go back to the, the background layer at any point in time and it being so neutral, mm -hmm. uh, it, it not having much pop or, or anything, I can make small adjustments to that without really affecting any of the, the layers uh, throughout it. So in this particular case, I'll make a new fill layer and we'll try out that uh, fantastic uh, Luma range tool. And I'll go ahead and I just want to grab my sky as much as I can. And experience is now teaching you exactly how far to slide things over and yeah. to, based upon what an image looks like. And you'll get that too. It's kind of like playing the piano after a while you know what to expect and you know where you can right. find a good starting point on some of these things. So I want to reduce my sensitivity all the way down to the bottom because I don't want this to be super sensitive. I want this to bleed and you know the, the, more, the more of a soft edge all of your layers have, the less you're going to run into all those halos okay. and all the things that when you have such a high resolution file, the things that really start to uh, degrade the quality of your, your post-processing. Uh, so my range, I want to make sure I just don't, or my radius, I don't want to get any of those halos, but that's, that's a great starting point for me. None of these adjustments are going to be so huge that it's going to cause sure. uh, real big problems. I'll turn off my mask, and now I'm going to go ahead and just start using these sliders. So I want to darken in my sky. I want to add some contrast. I'm actually going to go back and use my... Luma curve. Wow. 
By the way, while Drew's doing that, the noise you hear is our friend John Ross next door. Um, it's not a dentist, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a, a wood sculptor and wood maker. And uh, a lot of times he'll just stop when we ask him to, but when we're going all day like this, he's just going to... The man's got to work. Yeah, and he, he has fun doing what he's doing. So hopefully you won't be bothered too much by the extraneous noise. So, so what I'm doing now <clears throat> is I'm making the image looks awful right now, um, but I really wanted I all of this. That. <laughs> I really want all of this detail and contrast in the sky. So I overdo it and then I bring it back. So that Luma range has affected all of this water down here. I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to grab my eraser, and I'm going to turn on my mask, and I'm just going to remove it from any of the water. So that's not affected. So it's just on my sky. And now, what I really love about that we introduced this in Capture 111 is I'm just going to pull down the opacity of that mask. Oh, we didn't even talk about that, but that is a great thing to have. So now I can kind of balance it. So, I mean, it's over the top in the adjustment, but then as I pull down the opacity, I can kind of blend it in to where I want. That's great. You're not one for drama, are you? No, I, I like things simple. Um, so that's one layer, and we'll call that the sky, because it is the sky. Uh, and then I want to kind of, you know, brighten up the midtones of all of this stuff. So I'm just going to make uh, another layer. Uh, I'm going to grab the brush, turn off auto masking, just make it really big, and make it really, really soft and feathery. And I'm just going to. Paint in all this stuff. Down no here. auto masking or no. I mean, I don't really use auto masking. I think it's great for fine, <clears throat> fine details, but you know, my work. I'm, I'm I never want to get so precise with the masks, and the the Luma range tool allows me to you know get really precise with it if I if I want to. So I'm just going to fill in that mask and turn it off. Uh, I'll go into the Luma range tool. Actually, before we do that, I'll turn it into the grayscale. And then I'll go into my Luma range. So this will kind of help me with, instead of using auto mask, this is really going to help with the selection of those fine details. Mm -hmm. So I don't want any of those highlights in there, I just kind of want to get the midtones and start to shop this around, fix my fall off. Happy with that. And now I'm going to go in and just kind of adjust the exposure of my midtones, contrast of my midtones. And this is where your clarity stuff, I would start playing with that in my midtones. So I'm pretty happy with that. It's simple, it's clean. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and effect, uh, adjust just the color of the reds. This is something that you love to do. I'll go back to my color tab and my color editor, and I'm gonna grab just the red of the, uh, the covered bridge. I wanna be able to view the red that I'm selecting, so I turn that on, so this shows me everything that's selected. I always have this big, broad fall off or smoothness, so everything's nice and, and soft. Uh, I'm, as a safety, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a uh, mask from that selection. Okay. I might not use it, but it's going to make a mask from all of that red. And what's really nice about this is we have this big, dense red covered bridge. So you're actually creating a mask based upon selected color. Yep. Another, oh, I forgot that you could do that, man. Great so idea. Now if I go back here and I turn on my mask, I can see it just selected all that red tone. And it selected every, all the warm tones in my highlights and everything. What's really cool about the Luma range is now, because I have that mask, I can go in and I can refine that even further from the mask that I created from the color. That's pretty slick. So now if I want to get it off those highlights, well, I can just pull this down. Make sure I'm just dealing with the what is really red. Pull 
apply that. There's my mask of everything mm -hmm. that's red. And that's what I kind of want to bump up the exposure in and brighten it, bump up the, the contrast on, bump up the saturation a little bit. Well, we at least <clears> we have something. I can go back, now that I have that mask, I can go back to my color tab and I can just hit plus. So now I've created a, a selection of all the color that's in that mask. And I'll turn off that guy. And now I can affect the saturation. This is absolute saturation. Jesus. So this is, <clears throat> this is, you know, when you go crazy, but there's no smart, intelligent saturation in this. This is just bumping values up. So if I wanted to lighten those midtones that are all that red, mm -hmm. I can just select that in here and I can bring that up a little bit, bring up the saturation a little bit if I wanted to. I don't think I do. I can adjust the hue of that red. So I can kind of get that you know, more of a brick color, uh, more of a cyan color. But I think all I'm going to do... Oof. It wasn't that color. It wasn't that color, you're right. But you know what? I'm the artist. I decide what color okay. it was. So now, I'm more or less done, but I'm not super happy with that adjustment I just did toggle it on and off, and then, of course, blend it all together with the opacity. So again, starting in these broad strokes and blending it all together. Uh, one last thing that I'll probably do <clears throat> is make a new fill layer. Uh, so this is a layer covering the entire thing, and I'll go back and I'll see, can I adjust that contrast? Can I adjust those midtones? Because I'm on this independent layer, it's not going to affect you know, all the hard work that I just did on the... Uh, on the base image. Now, for those of you that are watching, you can put your cursor anywhere in the image and it will show yeah, on the curve. Yeah, it shows me where I kind of am. Yeah, so that's a, a cool tool to have too. So it gives you an idea of what you are going to affect. Mm -hmm. Tough scene, isn't it? It is. But doing it this way, no matter what adjustment I do, I always have this flexibility to yep, kind of blend in and out what it is I've done. So, you know, all these subtle adjustments that I did with that layer, all I did was kind of bump up those midtones, but I can see, well, you know, was that the right decision? Going back and forth, toggling this layer on and off, you know, just giving it some balance across yeah. everything else. I can do this, I mean, I could make 20 layers just doing a fill layer and a small adjustment and blending it together, which I think I'm going to do again. One more. I'll do another fill layer, the whole thing. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to adjust the white balance of that whole fill layer. Cooler or warmer? I'm going to make it cooler, I think. So it's really, really cold. Uh, and I'm probably going to increase my saturation a little bit. And then again, blend that, that layer into the image. And I'll probably do the exact same thing again, a new fill layer. I'm going to go crazy with the uh, clarity. But then... It's making it pop nice. But then blend that in. And what I really like about this workflow of making these, these fill layers, uh, blending in that adjustment using opacity, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is if there's something I don't like. You know, I like what the clarity is doing yep. to the water. I don't like how much saturation is on the barn and the sky's starting to get a little overworked uh, in some places, starting to flatten out. Because it's a mass layer, I can just go in here and I can erase you know, the sky. And I can erase the, the mill. Anything that I don't want that clarity adjustment to affect, now I have the ability to both sure. blend it in with opacity and go in and just you know, remove it. So now I can see just that, turn off the mask. Oh yeah. So that's with and without. Really clean up a lot of that, uh, that water. This is with and without, uh, I think that was a contrast adjustment and a saturation adjustment. You know, iteratively I can start to clean up the whole image. Now something when you're doing layers, um, you can, just keep adding layers and you get layer one, two, three, four. But as you can see with some of the layers that Drew did, he actually named those layers. And 
Uh, I like to go back after I'm done and know I'm going to keep the layers and actually yeah. identify which ones they are. And if, if I was doing this for sure. real with each individual step, I would say what I actually did. So, you know, this layer is uh, just my clarity. So I would call that uh, a clarity layer. And I would say that it's on the water. Sure. And again, with each one of these layers that I've changed the opacity on, I've changed what each individual layer is uh, adjusting, I can always go back to the Luma yep. range and kind of fine tune what that is. The other thing with layers you gotta be careful with is sometimes you'll make a layer adjustment and you'll go on to a different image and come back and you know, use a different control and can't figure out why you're not seeing a global adjustment and it's because you forget to take it back to a background layer. Right. So if you run into something like that, you know, take a look at your layers, scroll up and down and make sure you're selected back on background or make it a habit to uh, select background before you leave the image and go somewhere else with it. So now at the end, what I just did is I selected the original raw file. Yep. Uh, so this is all the data that I had and then where I've edited it. And I just make this comparison of what did I do wrong? Because you're always gonna get to that stage where you've looked at an image for so long and you realize like, okay, I kind of went a little too far. So right now this is a little too warm for my taste, especially that, that roof. So I'd go back and I'd kind of fine tune that roof. I think that there's more dynamics in the sky not being uh, as warm as I made it. I think if that went back to being this cooler Ooh, blue, cooler, yeah. uh, then I'd be just fine. And what's, what's fun with this is I can go back to my background layer and I can go back to the uh, color adjustment that I did on the highlights. Uh, and I can just hold down uh, Option or Alt and I can select and reset and see cool. where that kind of put the image. So in this particular case, that's closer to where I want to be, so I can just turn this down and I can darken this a little bit. And that's closer to where the original was just by going back yeah. to my background layer and kind of, you know, playing with toggling this on and off and saying, okay, well, where did I go wrong? Okay, I'm, cool. I'm happy with that. So the end of my workflow would be, you know, if I need to dust uh, spot this or I want to remove, you know, this, uh, this ice cream sign or anything in the image, this is when I would process this out as a PSD, go in there, make layers in uh, Photoshop, remove what I wanted to remove. Maybe I would even fine tune. I really like using the, uh, the, the selective color tool in uh, Photoshop. Yep, I do too. Uh, make that on a new layer. Then I just save that PSD, it's back in my catalog, I browse that PSD in Capture One and I process out my TIFFs and my JPEGs and whatever else I, I need. It's interesting. So the PSD thing is new to me. I mean, not that I don't know it exists, but uh, I see the benefit for doing it the way you're, you're doing it. Right. Uh, certainly a, a different kind of approach uh, towards the final image. Now, you, you're not using soft proofing at all, which is a tool that a lot of people would like to see, so we should yeah. make sure you're aware that there is a soft proofing tool in there if you want to adjust it to you know, either CMYK or RGB output, depending on what you're doing. Well, and I think that soft proofing for me comes in the final stage. Yeah. You know, what, what I would typically do with this is turn off all the sharpening, bring it into Photoshop, do my work, bring that PSD back into Capture One, do some sharpening, some soft proofing for the, the process recipes. So would you think that you would want to sharpen more in the PSD in Photoshop or, or use Capture One? Sharpening? I use Capture One to, uh, to sharpen it. Okay. So if we, if I go in here and I add the output uh -oh. folder, it has the PSD that I've just processed. And if we import and synchronize that one PSD that's, that's in there. So now, Capture One can see that PSD. So this is a PSD, but I can edit it just as if it was a raw file. Um, so if I made adjustments in Photoshop to remove things, it would be reflected in here. It's not a flattened PSD. There's still layers yep, in it. Yep. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, the image is, is archival for my editing so process. So when you save the PSD, forward. you're saving back to where you, you are right now. Yep, okay. and then I would go into my proofing profile, and this is where I would put on um, you know, a, a small JPEG. So here you have a recipe that's a small JPEG. Now I would turn on the proofing, zoom in 100%, sharpen that, that yep. specific image for that, uh, that process recipe, send it out, and then I'd turn off my sharpening and move forward from there. So that proofing is really helpful when you get to the stage of this is the final output. I wanna make sure that it's yep. the right sharpness for 72 DPI on web, yeah. it's the right sharpness for you know, a giant uh, Epson print et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think there, there's a nice thing on the sharpening tool too, because you have the ability to kind of um, 
uh, fix haloing a little bit if mm -hmm. you have to, which is a nice tool to have. And you've got a great diffraction tool in Capture One. Yeah. Um, you know, we all have our, our so-called rules that we learn along the way. You know, don't shoot a 22, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes, you know, you, to get a shot, you got to shoot a 22. And it's nice to know when you do, or 32, or even 45, mm -hmm. that there is a tool that even helps fix that little diffraction you might get. Yep. Uh, and uh, it does quite a good job of that. So, you know, little hidden gems inside Capture One, they're all over the place. Yeah, so you're referring to the halo suppression yep. for the, the sharpening. I turn off proofing here. If I had the image kind of over sharpened, you know, I have this halo suppression to just kind of try and yeah. blend uh, that over sharpened uh, aspect into the, the image. And then if we go back here for my distortion and my, my diffraction, I can actually analyze that image for any chromatic aberration to remove it. There's a, <clears throat> a purple fringe tool that I've removed because I never use it anymore. Uh, but all those things are in there. God, we used to have purple fringing on everything back in the, in the day. In the day. Say, in the day. Yeah, we got rid of all that. Yeah. So there you cool. go. That's well, my true, workflow thanks. that's very different than your workflow. Yeah, actually, I like your workflow better as far as the consumption of uh, a good glass of wine during it because yeah, it's a go. little more intense. But uh, <laughs> a different approach for sure and very, very cool. I like the way you've segmented your, your toolbar uh, across the top where I've kind of made mine, you know, vertical drop downs with expanding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tools. Um, uh, so, I, I, mean, I think the most important thing, you know, if I could communicate one of the, the more powerful aspects of Capture One to people that I see underutilized is having all these different layers, blending them all together, kind of making one layer specific to a color adjustment, one layer specific to a contrast adjustment. Yes. And, and really blending all those together. And now we have the added Luma Range tool to uh, even further uh, refine your selection. I'm gonna try some of the stuff that you've done here. Actually, you might try to actually reconvert some of my, uh, my workspace a little differently since I am crammed on the, yeah. the, the system that I right. And I saved my workspace on your computer, uh, so you're welcome to use that. And oh, you, know, you. you can take these little files and share them with anybody that's watching the That'd be cool. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I want to encourage before we sign off here is the fact that the only way you get good at this is to play with it. And, yeah. You know, playing is, you can't hurt anything, okay? Because you can always go back, you know, to the raw. And you can always create a new variant, either with the adjustments and or with the raw. And it's not uncommon for me sometimes to create several variants along the way. I might get to a certain level go, oh yeah, that's cool. And then I'll create and clone the variant with adjustments <coughs> and, you know, maybe take it a little bit further. Uh, and then sometimes I just start from scratch again and you can't really hurt it, but boy, do you learn tricks every now and then by, you know, doing yep. this kind of thing. Just play. And the more you learn the tricks, the, the quicker it is when you're approaching a certain subject matter and uh, the way you shoot it. Yeah, so. and being able to, <clears throat> to visualize that yep. out in the field. Drew? Hey, buddy. thanks, Kevin. Thanks, man. We well, hope to have Drew back and do some more of this sometime and uh, hope you're all getting something out of it. Take a look at Capture One if you haven't done so already. All the links will be in not only with uh, the video but in the article and so forth. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, we've got one more kind of special segment to go and uh, talk about. So uh, catch up with us a little bit and uh, we'll have some more fun. Of course. Always. Thanks, everybody. Cool. See you.